Let me begin, if I may, by just telling you about why I'm pro-life, how I came to be pro-life. And I'm going to start there because one of the things that surprised me is how often people say, well, you can't be pro-life. You're a Silicon Valley CEO. I mean, we know they're all pro-choice. So allow me to just begin with that. Then I want to talk very briefly about why I'm running for president and why it's so important that I and Jennifer and all of you stand for the sanctity of life. I was raised in a faithful household, but honestly, I didn't spend that much time thinking about it as a young woman until one of my very dear friends, was I, when I was in my early 20s, wanted to have an abortion. And she asked me to accompany her. She needed support. And so I went, and I accompanied her to a Planned Parenthood clinic and I watched while she was given no choices, no options, no counseling. And I also watched what all of that did to her, emotionally and physically and spiritually. She was not the same after that. A few years later, I met my husband, Frank. We've been together for 34 years. And as we were married, I learned that his mother had been told to abort him. She was a brave and faithful woman, and she brought her son into the world, although she had to spend almost a year in the hospital following his birth. And I know that Frank was the joy of her life, and he has always been the rock of mine, and I have thought often about how different my life would be if Frank were not in the world. And then, a little bit later in our marriage, I learned that I could not have children of my own. And so I learned in a completely different way what a precious gift life is. This has always been a nation of limitless possibility. This has always been a place where more things have been more possible for more people from more places than anywhere else on Earth. We are not a perfect nation. But we are a nation always that has known that every individual is precious, every life is precious, that every person is endowed with God-given gifts. We have always valued merit over privilege and hard work over entitlement. I'm a conservative because I know that no one of us is any better than any other one of us. And each of us are endowed with God-given gifts usually more than we realize. You guys are being really good. I'm so proud of you. Really good. You are. <laughs> I don't know whose TV channel that's. OK, Channel 8, say hello. You're on TV. I certainly know that this has been a nation of possibility for me, because I'm keenly aware having traveled and lived and worked, done business, done charity work all over the world for decades, that it's only in this nation that a young woman could start out the way I did, typing, filing, answering the phones for a little nine-person real estate firm in the middle of a deep recession, go on one day to become the chief executive of what we turned into the largest technology company in the world and run for the presidency of the United States. That is only possible here. I also have to tell you that along my life, every step of my life, I have been told by a lot of people to sit down and be quiet, settle. Don't challenge the status quo, just sit back and accept the way things are. And I have rejected that advice all of my life. I am running for the presidency of the United States because I think that's what the American people are being told. I think we're being told to settle. Don't rock the boat. Don't challenge the system. Just sit down and be quiet. I think we're being asked to settle for problems that have festered for decades. You name it. Whether it's debts, deficits, the increasing power of government, whether it's illegal immigration, the fact that we're not caring for our veterans, the fact that we're not securing our borders, the fact that we're not keeping our nation safe, you name it, our problems aren't getting solved. In fact, they're getting worse. I think we're being asked to accept a government and a political system that doesn't work for us anymore. You see, the government doesn't work for us anymore. 
It works for itself. It nurtures itself. It nourishes and protects itself. 75% of the American people have now figured out the federal government's corrupt. Corrupt in the sense that it favors some over others. And the people that the federal government favors now are the big, the powerful, the wealthy, and the well-connected. And the small and the powerless are getting crushed. I think we're being told to settle for a nation where record numbers of men are out of work, record numbers of women are living in poverty. We have record numbers of abortions year after year after year. We have working families' incomes that have stagnated for decades. We have young people that don't even believe the American dream exists for them anymore. I think we're being told to accept a political class that says and does whatever is necessary to win election and then goes off and says and does whatever they like of both parties. And 80% of the American people have figured out we have a professional political class that cares more about its own power, position, and privilege than on getting anything done. Now, you know, there are some people in this race who claim to be outsiders, but they are the ultimate insiders. And the ultimate insider, of course, the ultimate crony capitalist is Donald Trump, who has made billions of dollars buying off people inside the system. We're not going to stop crony capitalism and challenge the system by electing the ultimate insider who's made billions off the system. Mostly, though, we're being told to sit down and be quiet about our God, about our guns, and about the sanctity of life. And I personally am tired of being told that those of us who believe that life begins at conception are extreme. In fact, science bolsters us every single day. We now know there is proof positive that the DNA in a zygote is precisely the same as the DNA the day you die. So I personally don't know where to draw that line. I'm being I'm tired of being told that we're extreme when, in fact, it is the Democrats who are extreme. It is extreme to say that it's not a life until it's born. You may remember I ran for the Senate in California, and I ran as a pro, proud pro-life conservative, and you don't do that unless you really mean it. And I remember having a debate with Barbara Boxer, and she made this statement. She said, well, you know, it's not a life until it leaves the hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, that is extreme. It is extreme to say that a 13-year-old girl needs her mother's permission to go to a tanning salon but not to get an abortion. And it is extreme to say that a tattoo parlor needs to be more rigorously regulated than an abortion clinic. I believe we can solve every problem we have. I believe we can heal all our wounds. I believe we can protect the unborn. I believe we can resolve our festering problems, but to do so, we're going to have to remember who we are. And ours was intended to be a citizen government. We were never intended to have a vast, bloated federal government bureaucracy that sucks more life out of this nation every single year. And we were never intended to have a professional political class that says what it needs to say, but then actually won't fight the good fight. I am running for the presidency of the United States because I think it's time. I think it's time we take our future back. I think it's time we take our politics and our government back, citizens. I think it's time we take our country back. It is why I've rolled out this blueprint. And while we can talk about every single aspect of this blueprint, these are the things that I want you to hold me accountable for. These are things that we can get done. They're not the only things we have to do, but they are the first and most important things we have to do. They have to do with cutting our government down to size and holding it accountable, lifting its weight and complexity off of our economy so we can create more jobs. They have to do with getting the government out of things like health care, securing our borders, protecting our nation, leading again in the world. But this blueprint also, you will notice, on this blueprint is an item that says restore the character of our nation. Because when we do not stand for the sanctity of life, when we do not stand for religious liberty, we are undermining the character of our nation. The vast majority of Americans were shocked and horrified to learn that Planned Parenthood clinics were altering late-term abortion techniques for the purposes of harvesting body parts. Now, you know I have stood up and talked about that over and over and over. No one has been a louder speaker of the truth on this issue than Carly Fiorina. And you also know that I was pilloried in the media. I was called a liar. Everybody said, how can she be saying this? It's not true. But you know what? It is true. We cannot be a nation that permits this. 
It's interesting. The media doesn't want you to know this. Not everyone in the media, but a lot of the media doesn't want you to know the truth. Certainly a lot of politicians don't want you to know the truth. While we're being painted as extreme, the truth is that Americans have found common ground on even the issue of the sanctity of life. Even those people who do not yet agree with us that life begins at conceptions do agree with this. The vast majority of Americans now agree that there's no reason at all to permit abortion after five months. So I will make sure that as President of the United States, we finally pass the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. <laughs> the majority of Americans agree that it is not fair, if nothing else, that Planned Parenthood is receiving taxpayer funding when in truth Planned Parenthood is a political operation. Year after year after year they give millions of dollars to pro-abortion candidates. If nothing else, the American people have figured out that isn't fair. And so in my first budget, President Fiorina will not fund Planned Parenthood to one single dime. Ladies and gentlemen, our nation has reached a perilous and pivotal time. This election matters. You know, it's the definition of insanity to expect different results by doing the same thing over and over and over again. We cannot keep electing the same kind of leaders. We actually need to elect a leader who will work with the citizens of the United States and get done what we need to get done. First, of course, we have to start by beating Hillary Clinton. And, or Bernie Sanders, whoever it is, but you know what? I mean, honestly, amazing, isn't it? We have a committed socialist who's leading in the Democrat Party. And Hillary Clinton cannot tell us the difference between socialism and the Democrat Party platform. Wow, the whole world's gone insane, huh? Except that we're not insane. We're not insane. When Whether you've decided you're going to back me or not, you know in your heart of hearts you can't wait to see a debate between me and Hillary Clinton. You just can't wait. And you know why? Because you know I'm going to win. That's why. And you know I will not shy away from this fight over the sanctity of life. And I will not shy away from the fight of who's extreme. But then we have to have a leader who can get the job done. So I'm going to ask you to think about what it actually takes in these perilous, pivotal, important times in the United States of America, what it actually takes for someone to be President of the United States and Commander in Chief. I believe we need a leader in the Oval Office who actually understands how the economy works, who understands where jobs come from, how they get destroyed, how they get saved, and how they get created, because we have to create a heck of a lot more jobs in this economy than we are right now. I think we need a leader who understands the world and how it works. And the truth is, I have more foreign policy experience than virtually anyone running. I've met almost as many world leaders as Hillary Clinton, but I didn't do photo ops with them. I had meetings, private meetings, on business and charity and policy work. I've held the highest clearances available to a civilian. I've advised the NSA, the CIA, two secretaries of defense, a secretary of state, and a secretary of homeland security. I know our military and our intelligence leaders and capabilities well. And so I know when we are not standing with our allies, when we do not confront our adversaries, when we do not respond to provocation, when we will not care for our veterans, when we will not invest in our military, then the world becomes a very dangerous and tragic place. I think we need a president who understands bureaucracies, because our governments become one gigantic bureaucracy that needs to be cut down to size and held accountable. I think we need a president who understands technology. This is the most competition I've ever had during a speech. <laughs> I think we need a president who understands technology because technology is a great and powerful tool that I'm going to use to engage citizens in the process of their government. I hope you'll ask me how. But it's also a weapon that's being used against us. And we need a president who understands what to do about that. But I think most importantly of all, we need somebody who understands what leadership is. Leadership is sometimes making a tough call in a tough time and standing up and being held accountable. And we cannot elect people who've never made a tough call in, them, in their lives. But leadership, I have to say, 
is also about challenging the status quo because that's how you solve festering problems. And I have never been afraid to challenge the status quo. The way you go from secretary to CEO is you challenge the status quo every step of the way and you produce results over and over and over again. And you do what you say you're gonna do. And that's what I will do for the American people. But perhaps the most important thing I have learned about leadership is something I learned a long time ago. When I was that secretary, typing and filing and answering the phones, I used to think that leaders were whoever had the big office, whoever had the big title, whoever had the big parking space. And then I got a little older and wiser and I learned that there were people with big offices, big titles, big parking spaces and big egos to go along with it that were not leading. You see, leadership has nothing to do with the size or even the shape of your office. And it certainly has nothing to do with the size of your ego. A leader's highest calling is to unlock potential in others. My highest calling is to restore citizen government to this great nation, to once again stand for the character of this nation. Citizens, So I ask you, do not sit down and be quiet any longer. Don't settle. Don't accept. Stand with me. Fight with me. Caucus for me. Citizens, it is time to take our country and our character back. Let me tell you the kind of people I want to select. I'm not going to give you a name. Because the truth is, I know, as you know, that character is revealed over time and under pressure. And I think we are seeing people's character revealed over time and under pressure. I also know that character is not about what you say. Character is defined by what you do. So I watch what people do, not what they say. But here are the kind of people I'm going to surround myself with. First, leaders. And the way I define leaders is, as I said a few minutes ago, leaders are people who are prepared to challenge the status quo. They are prepared to serve. I don't want people who want to go to the cocktail circuit and settle into their big office and talk about their big title. I want people who are going to roll up their sleeves and go to work on behalf of the American people to take our country back. And that means a lot of them are going to have to cut their departments down to size and hold them accountable instead of just going along to get along. A second quality that I will look for in the people I surround themselves with. I want them to bring something different to the table than I bring. Different experiences, different skills. You see, I've learned in the course of my life that the best teams are made up of people who complement each other instead of people who are all alike. You know, it's easy. When we create a team that's just like us, it's easy. You know, we finish each other's sentences. We always agree. Yeah, what he said, that's right. Except that if we all are just the same, we're going to miss something important. So I want people who bring something different to the table. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I want people who are going to tell me the truth. People who are going to tell everybody the truth. Not the yes people, the truth tellers. Because we don't tell enough truth in this country, and we don't tell enough truth in government or politics either. So one of the things that we must do is create more jobs. It's vital. We're not creating enough jobs. I mean, I know the administration keeps throwing out these statistics and how everything's so great, even though we're growing at less than 2%, but it's not great. We have record numbers of men out of work. We have record numbers of women living in poverty. And we also have programs of entitlement that have tangled people's lives up in webs of dependence instead of saying to people, you have God-given gifts. Let me answer your question in two ways, but I must pause and just tell you a brief story because it underpins everything I believe. Before I was running for president, I was chairman of an organization called Opportunity International. It is a Christian-based organization. It also happens to be the largest private microfinance lender in the world. We have lent $8 billion, $100 at a time. And I have spent time in some of the most desperate and destitute places on earth. And I have seen what happens when you say to somebody, despite your desperate and destitute circumstances, you have potential. You have God-given gifts. You can live a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. 
Everyone needs a helping hand sometimes. Everyone needs somebody to take a chance on them. I have needed both of those things. But if we will recognize that every single individual is possessed of God-given gifts and potential and that they want to live a life of dignity and purpose and meaning, then we will understand that we have to revamp most of these programs that don't encourage people to move forward in their lives. Instead, we encourage people to set back, settle in, and let someone else take care of them. That is not a fulfilling life. So, first, we have to revamp all of those programs of dependence because truly we are not asking people to move forward in their lives. We are discouraging them from doing so. Secondly, we have to create lots more jobs, millions more jobs. And we know what that takes. It takes, first, understanding where jobs come from. You know where jobs come from, ladies and gentlemen? Big companies are important, but big companies don't create most of the jobs. You know who creates most of the jobs? Small business, family-owned businesses and farms, the little nine-person real estate firm that I started out in. My husband, Frank, started out driving a tow truck in a family-owned auto body shop. That's where jobs come from, and we are crushing small and family-owned businesses. In fact, small and family-owned businesses and farms create two-thirds of the new jobs in this country and employ half the people, and we're crushing them. And so that's why one of the very first items on this list is to revamp, radically simplify the tax code, because it is complexity of government that crushes the small and powerless. Here's the truth, ladies and gentlemen, when government gets big, powerful, costly, and complicated, only the big, the powerful, and the wealthy and the well-connected can handle it. It is called crony capitalism. It has been alive and well in this country under Republicans and Democrats alike. So. We have to say to every individual, we will not leave you behind. You have God-given gifts, and we will help you find and use them. And that means training and tools and support. We must lift the weight of this government off of the job creators in this nation so that we create more and more and more jobs. And we must also say to anyone, regardless of their age, you can learn new skills, and we will invest in you so that you can. All of those things can be done. I commit to you that together we will get all those things done. Well, let me start by saying that I generally don't want to tinker around with the Constitution because it's been a pretty good blueprint for this nation. The problem is we don't follow it. So where I would start, honestly, is the kind of people that I will appoint. So let me talk about that because the next president of the United States will probably have the opportunity to appoint anywhere from two to four Supreme Court justices. That is enormous power. And as we have seen, there have been people who've been put on the bench that we really thought were conservatives. It turned out they were not at all. So I have to answer this question by telling you a little story first. My dad taught me conservatism. Bear with me here. My dad, he was a law professor. And he would come home every day from work. And I, because I adored my dad, I would sit at his knees and watch him as he watched the news. And he would yell at Walter Cronkite every night. <laughs> and I would ask him why, and he would explain. And then the next morning, he'd yell at the New York Times. And I would say, Daddy, why do you watch and read this? It gets you so upset. No, oh, no, and he'd explain. Some years later, my father was appointed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the most liberal court in the land. And my dad's a true blue conservative. And I watched my father for 25 years withstand pressure. The pressure from his peers, the pressure from the media, pressure to change his mind. And he did not. And so he wrote dissenting opinion after dissenting opinion. He was proud of the fact that when the Supreme Court would reverse the Ninth Circuit, which happened on a fairly regular basis, that they usually would point to his dissenting opinions. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because you see, I think what we've had are people who claim to be conservative but then do not have the courage of their convictions. And they succumb to pressure. So the first thing I will commit to you is I will spend a lot of time getting to know the individuals that I will nominate for the Supreme Court. That's important because some of the biggest mistakes that have ever been made on the Supreme Court were made by presidents who handed the job of selecting somebody off to say a White House counsel and didn't hardly know the person before they nominated them. You better know somebody, really know them, if you're going to determine that they deserve a lifetime appointment. 
And the second thing I'm going to look for is not just someone who has a track record of writing about conservative values. I'm going to look for someone who has a track record of standing up for our values when it's hard, when it's unpopular, when you got a lot of pressure to go the other way. I'm going to look for men and women like my dad. Yes. Well, it's a critically important um, topic, and it's a big topic, but actually the solutions are fairly clear, I think. We just need the courage to do it. So remember when Nancy Pelosi famously said, we got to pass it to know what's in it? Well, it turns out there are all kinds of horrible things in it. There's not only things that destroy the sanctity of life at all stages of life, but, you know, also buried in the pages of Obamacare is the federal government takeover of the student loan business. So we now literally have a situation where the federal government makes money off of every student loan. That's a racket, folks. And most of the Amer American people literally have no idea because it was buried in there. We must repeal Obamacare. I say that as a cancer survivor. So I'm a walking, talking, pre-existing condition. And I understand that you cannot have a health care crisis bankrupt a family. We buried our daughter to the demons of addiction. So I also understand that there are places in our health care system where we're not investing enough. We're not investing enough in the treatment of mental illness or the prevention and treatment of addiction. But Obamacare isn't working. And here we have, think about it, here we have our own government suing in the Supreme Court, the little sisters of the poor, over their right to practice their religion as they see. We cannot be silent for this. But beyond that, beyond the fact that it's undermining our religious liberties, health insurance premiums are going up, emergency room visits are going up, we're dumping more and more people into Medicaid, fewer and fewer doctors are accepting Medicaid, so who are we helping? And meanwhile, because big companies who helped write this bill, the health insurance companies, the drug companies, hospitals, big hospital chains, because the big and powerful always have to bulk up when government gets big and powerful, you see the insurance companies, the drug companies, the pharmaceuticals, the hospital chains, they're consolidating. This is what happens, ladies and gentlemen. The bigger government gets, the bigger people have to get to deal with it. So we're going to repeal it. What are we going to replace it with? Three things. Number one, states will have the resources and the responsibility to manage high-risk pools. Because when you give money and power and responsibilities back to states and communities, the decision making is more responsible because it's closer to the people being impacted by it. And we have examples of states managing high risk pools and helping people that have worked. Secondly, the, health, the federal government should not mandate care. It should not mandate what health insurance plan you buy, but it should mandate this. Every health care provider must publish on a regular basis their costs, their prices, their outcomes. Yes, you can applaud. <laughs> you know why that's important? You know why that's important? Because we as patients, we as consumers of health care have no idea what we're buying. I have spent a lot of time in a hospital for myself, for my parents, and the Truth is, none of us have any idea what the cost of care is or the price of care is. And I didn't know whether the hospital I had my mom in was better or worse than a hospital 100, way, 100 miles away. In other words, when you have no information, you have no power. And we have no power in the healthcare system today. And the other problem, of course, is that when there is no information about costs or quality, there's no incentive for cost to go down and quality to go up. Last but not least. We're going to do in health insurance what we've never done. We've never had a free market. Never. We have always had a cozy little game between regulators and health insurance companies. We used to play it on the state level. And regulators and health insurance companies got together and set out the rules for competition. And frankly, they limited competition. I come from the most competitive industry in the world. The most relentlessly competitive industry in the world is technology. And guess what? You have come to expect from technology every year cooler, price, cooler apps, better products, better prices, year after year after year, and that's what you get. 
So we're going to have a free market in health insurance where anyone can compete for your business, and you get to buy the coverage you want at a price you can afford, and you get to practice your religion how you choose. There are several things we are going to do. We're going to get pass the Pain Cable Love More Than Child Protection Act. We're not going to fund Planned Parenthood anymore. And I think you have seen enough from me. I hope you have seen enough from me now to know that I will stand and use that bully pulpit day after day after day. No one is going to tell me to sit down and be quiet. Not on this issue, not on any issue. And the more we talk, the more people learn the more we find common ground. The truth is the majority of young people, the majority of women, the majority of Americans are horrified by the reality of par partial birth abortion, but we keep burying it. Remember, I don't know if you recall Nancy Pelosi and Mrs. Clinton basically saying, oh, no, 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 it doesn't happen. They're denying it happens because they know. They know if people knew the truth, how horrified we would be. Truth is a powerful medicine. And I am unafraid to tell the truth. But I will tell you something else. You know, I wrote down this blueprint because I want you to hold me accountable. You see, we never hold politicians accountable. We don't ever hold them accountable for what they promised us. We don't ever hold the politicians, most of, many of whom are running for office this time around, we don't hold them accountable if they say something different one time than another. I come from the same world you do. We know actions speak louder than words. We actually know that if you say you're going to do something, you better do it. And if you ask me how you go from secretary to CEO, I'll tell you how you go from secretary to CEO. You deliver what you said you were going to. You say what you're going to do, and you do it over and over and over. So ladies and gentlemen, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable for standing up every single day, making progress every day as we find common ground. But hold me accountable for standing up every day and speaking the truth about the precious gift that life always is and how we are undermining the character of our nation if we will not stand for the sanctity of every life. I promise not to belabor this question, but I do want to point out, thank you for the question about partial birth abortion. Just so you know, abortion on demand does happen in the United States. In Iowa, it does happen through all nine months of a woman's pregnancy. When we're talking about pregnancy, when we're talking about partial birth abortion or late-term abortion, we are talking about a baby at 26 weeks in the womb. You can stop by our table afterward and look at all of the fetal development that we have laid out. But when we're talking about a 26-week-old baby, you know, in gruesome manner, losing their life, this is the face of partial birth, of partial birth abortion. So I just wanted to take a moment and let you know this is who we're defending when we say we need to end late-term abortion. Thank you, Jennifer. And, you know, it's interesting. Science really helps us now. And so just to add to what Jennifer just said, you know, we are now able to conduct in utero surgery successfully before 20 weeks. Boy, that sounds like a life to me. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, I'm accosted all the time. I, I'm actually, I wear it as a badge of honor, but, uh, you know, I've been chased all over Iowa by shouting Planned Parenthood protesters. And one of the things that these young women, and I think they are not well informed, one of the things these young women stand and shout into my face is, don't you care about women's health? And the answer is, like, of course I care about women's health. So ask yourself this question. Why is it that the Democrat Party continually resists funding for women's health centers or pregnancy centers? Why do they resist funding organizations that actually care for women's health? Because it's not about women's health, folks. It's about a political operation that is focused on electing pro-abortion candidates. That's why. Truth is a powerful medicine. Yes, ma'am, you are right. So um, one of the things you may notice when you, and by the way, uh, I'd encourage you to go on to carlyforpresident.com uh, if we haven't gotten to your questions about the things in the blueprint. But if you look at this blueprint, what you will notice is one of the items is not Social Security reform. 
And let me tell you why. As I said, these are not the only things we have to do. These are just the first things we have to do. And I believe before we start talking to the American people about what we need to do with Social Security, we better restore the American people's faith in the basic competence and honesty of their government and their politicians. And they've lost it. And that's bad for a citizen government. You can't have 80% of the American people saying politics and government is just a big game for somebody else and I don't get to play it. And that's what we have. So this is focused on getting control of the money, getting control of our government, restoring the character of our nation. However, we're going to have to get around to Social Security. Now, let me also ask you this. How many presidential elections, you're really sophisticated purveyors of politicians here in Iowa. How many presidential elections have politicians come out here and talk to you about Social Security reform? Every single one, ladies and gentlemen. And have we ever done it? Have we ever even started to do it? In fact, politicians talk to you about the same things cycle after cycle after cycle. Republicans always talk to you about Social Security reform, tax reform, reducing debts and deficits. They talk about it all. They've never done it. There are loads of great ideas about how to reform Social Security, but unless and until we have a leader who's prepared to work with the citizens of this nation to put pressure on Congress to challenge the status quo, we're never going to get around to them. When it's time, I'm going to present to the American people a number of options, because there are a number of options, but I will promise you this. If you have put money into Social Security, whether you are 66, 86, or 26, the money you have put into Social Security belongs to you. It does not belong to the government. It is not something the government can take away from you. It's your money. And the government has made a contract with you and a commitment to you, and I will keep that contract and honor that commitment. Yes, of course we can do that. And by the way, think, think about for a moment, think about what she just said. We have, look, for the last 50 years, rules have rolled out of Washington. We've never repealed any of them. I mean, the EPA controls all the water in Iowa now. We have rules that make no sense at all. If you want to become, here's just an example where you're talking about small business. Do you know if you're a woman and you want to become a hairdresser, it's going to take you a year to get a license, but if you want to be an emergency medical technician, you can get that done in three months. Does that make any sense to you at all? No, it doesn't. We have this thicket of rules, and despite all those rules, we're not regulating abortion clinics. And ask yourself this, who are these rule makers? Who are these people who are making rules? Whether it's the EPA or OSHA, which doesn't bother with pro-abortion clinics, who are these people? They're not elected, they're not accountable. They're nameless, faceless bureaucrats. We have become a nation of rules, not a nation of laws. And those rules do not reflect the priorities of this nation or its citizens. So first, I'm going to do a top-to-bottom review of every single rule. We're going to start rolling them back. And yes, we're going to put in place common-sense regulation to actually protect the safety and health of women and children. That you can count on. So the foundation that I think you're uh, referring to is the Frank and Carly Fiorina Foundation. Uh, it's not a huge foundation like Bill Gates, but uh, we, we put as many resources into it as we can. And we have focused uh, our work there on things that we think unlock potential. So we've focused on uh, education. Uh, for example, uh, I am a founding member of something called the African Leadership Academy. I've spent a lot of time in the continent of Africa, and it is a richly blessed continent, but it lacks leadership. And so this is a school that um, admits kids from all over the continent, regardless of their means, and trains them in leadership, because leadership always makes a difference. Uh, we have invested a lot in um, Opportunity International. We've invested a lot in veterans groups. We've invested a lot in wounded warriors. Um, we are looking to make a difference in people's lives so that they have an opportunity to find and use their God-given gifts. Thank you for asking that question. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. We treat, we cover politics like it's a sport, like it's a game, 
my team is going to beat your team. What celebrity endorsed what other celebrity? I mean, it's a game. Except it's not. It's not a game anymore. Because politics and politicians and the policies they pursue have an impact on every single American's life, those born and those unborn. I can win this race. I can win this race. And you can help me win. We have ground games in all the early states. We have leadership teams in 25 states. I'm tied with household names, governors who aren't even on the ballot in all 50 states. We are. So don't think that a caucus vote for Carly Fiorina isn't going to do any good. You're going to do me a world of good. Send me out of here with the wind at my back. I promise you, my fellow citizens, I will stand with you. So I ask you to stand with me. It is time. It is time that we take our future back for those born and unborn. It is time we take our politics and our government back. Citizens, it is time we take our country back and restore its character. Thank you and God bless you.